It's a cold and misty day in ghostly Northamptonshire and I'm standing at the station on the platform and there's a figure emerging out of the mist and it is Mark Gatiss. Hello Mark. Hello, hello. Very nice to see you. Welcome to Northamptonshire. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I hope you're already noting the MR James qualities of the day. Yes, I imagined you'd have them laid on. There's a proper mist in the fields. It's very chilly, first time this year. Yes, bare trees against a white sky and mist curling at our feet. And I'll do my own crows. Ah, ah. It's not right unless you have a crow doing that. We'll start with that. I mean, it's a perfect mise-en-scene, really, isn't it, for talking about ghosts and MR James. It's got all the ingredients. Very uh, appropriate to our endeavours today. Well, welcome, Mark, to Finder. This is the green. It is the sort of beating heart of Finder, not so beating today. It's like the telltale heart, but only one beat every 100 years. It's lovely to meet you properly, by the way. Yes, it's, well, it's been a while coming, hasn't it? So we did a, an interview last year talking about ghosts and Christmas ghosts particularly, and at the end of which you invited me to come to your parish here in Finder because you said it was the most haunted parish in... In, in God's own world. <laughs> <laughs> but we can certainly give Borley Rectory a run for its money. Oh, wow. Northamptonshire is famously a haunted place and Finden, I think, is the most densely haunted settlement in the whole of the county. Blimey. Yeah, so we have oh. lots and lots of ghosts. I will literally be the judge of that. <laughs> <laughs> and we have sort of... I mean, our lives are different, obviously, but they also overlap. And the overlap is, around, I think, a sort of fascination with ghosts, and particularly M.R. James. And you are now the ghost master of Christmas. I'm like the Dark Father Christmas. I, <laughs> I bring things to people's doors that they don't want. <laughs> it was a family tradition for us to have a ghost story at Christmas. I think it began actually with A Christmas Carol. Yeah, well, I, I always read uh, A Christmas Carol unless I'm in it. You know, I was in it last year, so I didn't bother because I was living it every night. But uh, I usually usually read Christmas Carol, and I will definitely read at least one M.R. James. But having spent most of the year trying to make one, it's a similar sort of thing. Can you tell me what was the first ghost story you ever read? I mean, the first ones I ever read were the pan horror anthology books herbert van tal do you remember absolutely i remember and some of the covers of those books i still can't quite look at because they scared me so much eye sockets yes horrible things. there's one with a, 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 a hand coming through a grave with an eyeball in the middle that was my favorite Everything, yeah i remember that the thing that first really fired my imagination was the mr james ghost stories which i read as a boy my first was E. Nesbitt's Man Sized in Marble. Do you know that? It's a wonderful story about two effigies which come to life. It terrified me. And then I got a book on, on M.R. James out of the library. I do remember reading Whistle and I'll Come to You and feeling for the first time the grip of terror. I'd never read something that had produced that effect in me before and thinking, this is a masterwork. I mean, a very good place to begin our exploration is here at Harridan Books, which is Findon's bookshop, second-hand bookshop, run by Mike, and many a musty volume you will find on its shelves. Nothing could be more perfect. Let's do it. Oh, well, this is a proper bookshop, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot of books, obviously. Oh, <laughs> take a smell of that. Oh, yes, is that's, that that's the stuff. A very it's like the tractate middeth in here. It's, there is something, isn't there, about the musty smell of books and opening yeah. one and it releasing its energies and its power. And its spores. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's very churchy as well, though, isn't it? Right. There's, there's nothing like the smell of a church. Yeah. I think if we're going to find some... Oh, look, Dennis Wheatley. What do you know of Dennis Wheatley? Well, I remember, like many 60-year-old males of my background, that the covers offered a tantalising glimpse of an adult life that was just beyond our reach when we were 13 or 14. A mixture of sex and the occult. I've read quite a lot weekly. It's almost impossible to read, but The Devil Rides Out is, is very good. It's a great story and a brilliant Hammer film, one of the best Hammer films. Although the, the bit they miss from the film which is the centre point of the whole story, is it revolves around the theft of the mummified phallus of the god Set, I think, which mysteriously Hammer decided not to, not to go with. <laughs> Props? No way, sir. We'll skip that a bit. 
Who have you got here? Well, obviously Lovecraft. Who was hugely influenced by M.R. James. Yeah. yeah. Not a nice man. Not a nice man. Not a nice man. Unlike, no. uh, unlike Monty James. He would make you want to invite Alistair Crowley round again, wouldn't yeah. he? Yeah. Yes. Let's have him back. He was nice. We've got Edgar Allan Poe, great writer. August Derleth, of course. And here, if I sort through these dusty tomes, yeah, the collected ghost stories of M.R. James. Uh, and this is one of my favourites. Richard is going to do the latter, because like Peter Cook, I never had it. <laughs> Quis est iste qui venit. I ought to be able to make it out, he thought, but I suppose I am a little rusty in my Latin. When I come to think of it, I don't believe I even know the word for a whistle. Long one does seem simple enough. It ought to mean, who is this who is coming? Well, the best way to find out is evidently to whistle for him. He blew tentatively and stopped suddenly, startled and yet pleased at the note he had elicited. It had a quality of infinite distance in it, and soft as it was, he somehow felt it must be audible for miles round. It was a sound, too, that seemed to have the power, which many scents possess, of forming pictures in the brain. He saw quite clearly for a moment a vision of a wide, dark expanse of night with a fresh wind blowing, and in the midst, a lonely figure. How employed, he could not tell. Perhaps he would have seen more had not the picture been broken by the sudden surge of a gust of wind against his casement, so sudden that it made him look up, just in time to see the white glint of a sea bird's wing somewhere outside the dark panes. So that's uh, an extract from A Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad, which is one of my favourites, one of the most famous of M.R. James's stories, obviously. But uh, it's a sort of quintessential James story. Uh, a a middle-aged academic bachelor going to an out-of-the-way place and uh, despite all the red flags planted around him and waving at his face, ignoring all the warnings and, and doing the one thing... Uh, you shouldn't do, which is which is find a bone whistle and blow on it. <laughs> There's always a thing, isn't there? There's something like the the crown of the king of. England, or uh, there's a, a device, isn't there, oddly wrought, covered in runes or with some strange inscription, this kind of mystical portal to a lost world. Mm. Yeah, I mean, James, and James was this extraordinary figure. Uh, Lytton Strachey, I think, famously said that it was a life without a jolt. And he went straight from Eton to Cambridge back to Eton, didn't really experience much of the real world. So it's all through this academic sort of prism and all his i mean the, there are books indeed there are books to be written about the the repression that which led to all these strange uh phenomena in in his stories and what it all represents but it's the quintessential english ghost story that's why he's regarded i think as, as still as the as the master because they there's something so right about that structure we're so used to the tropes of ghost stories that perhaps we forget just how original and distinctive he was, and indeed is. I think his sense of landscape is extraordinary, particularly when he's writing about East Anglia, which of course he knew very well as a Cambridge person. But those huge open landscapes with mist rolling in and figures that are indistinct and you can't tell if they're near or far away. It actually sounds a bit like Father Ted looking at cows. <laughs> but, but do you know what and I mean? James is an unacknowledged influence on Father Ted. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Didn't you, you said that he was um, kind of insulated from the real world but i don't think he was actually i think his world was as real as anybody else's and it was a disrupted world wasn't it because he grew up in the absolute golden if to, to have been a don at cambridge in the late victorian edwardian period must have been as good a life as anyone ever lived for settledness and comfort i guess and then the first world war came along and think of all those young men who used to entertain with his stories and his sherry the chit chat club wasn't mm -hmm. it um, who went off to Flanders and didn't come back. It must have been devastating. Yes, absolutely. There's a lot of the, the, I think the only reason he ever published his stories was to, was for his, uh, allow his friend to illustrate them. And then he died of appendicitis. And he was, I think it was clearly the great love of his life. It totally destroyed him. It is a, absolutely, it's of course, it's a life well lived. It's just, it's about the absence of outside uh, experience, I suppose, apart bar occasional foreign trips. You know. It's very striking, isn't it, that the monsters that appear so frequently in his work, slimy tentacles, 
clutching hands. Difficult not to, from where we are, to interpret that as a sort of physical invasion that perhaps he didn't ever experience in life. Perhaps he did, I don't know. And he interviewed a man called Canon Adrian Carey, who knew him and whose father, Monty James, was very keen on. And um, Adrian was about 95 when I interviewed him, an extraordinary man. And I was tiptoeing so carefully around the subject. I said, do you think that Monty's influ interest in your father was better? And he just said, I think he's what we would now call a non-practicing homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> It kind of reads like that to us. It seems so self-evident, doesn't it? But I mean, there's so much in literature of that period where you sort of thank God for lives lived clandestinely or codedly because it produced such a rich literature, if nothing else. Yes, it's the trouble with repression. It makes great art. So Rome has brooded brood the, witch, the queen. witch queen. Unknown so to me. No, yeah, me too. But we do have sort of Nefertiti looky likey in a tomb, yeah. in a headdress, brood of the witch queen. The ones I also remember that were the Fontana Book of Ghost Stories, oh, sure. edited by the great Robert Aikman, one of the great ghost story writers. And, um, and there were some of them that I couldn't look at. There's one still, I looked it up on the internet the other day, it was the 13th, and it's a ghoul on a grave, and, and I couldn't look at the picture. And it still makes me go funny. There's a mechanism in a ghost story isn't there, that obviously is powerful and important, a bit like murder mysteries, that mm. they do something, don't they? Is it something to do with anxiety? They earth our anxieties, they make us better able to face the day. Roald Dahl, who um, did a wonderful collection of ghost stories, and the, the introduction to them is genuinely fascinating because he, in the 50s, was commissioned to do an anthology series, and he read thousands of stories. But I think he says, it's the closest that prose comes to poetry because of the concentration of, of effect. Yeah. So it's like telling a joke. If it doesn't scare you, it hasn't worked. It's not a ghost story. I think that weirdly, ghost stories are optimistic. Yeah. Now, obviously, particularly in James, they are, they are malevolent revenants and they're always they're out to get you. But at their base, they are optimistic because they promise more. They promise something beyond, even if it's horrible. <laughs> so, Richard, where are we heading now? Well, we're going to find his most famous haunted site, which is the, the girls' school, the old charity school. Do you, do you have a particularly haunted childhood yourself? No, not particularly. I mean, I love ghosts and ghost stories and everything, but I don't think I ever saw or heard one. At school, we used to sometimes do Ouija board, I think, and terrify ourselves. And except me and my friend Porky, I think we both rather fancied ourselves as mediums. So we were perhaps pushing in contrary directions. I think that's, I think everyone does that, don't they? But also, growing up around the same time, it was a particularly ripe period, you know, all, all children's programming was vaguely supernatural. If it didn't have a stone circle in, it wasn't worth having. And there was a tremendous uh, spike in sort of supernatural literature and devil worship was very, is very in, wasn't it? Well, so we had, we had a coven of witches here in Findon. You used to meet in Findon Hall when it was derelict. One of my ghost stories we did in um, Essex uh, a couple of years ago, Martin's Close, and basically the park superintendent was a huge help to us and uh i said what what are your biggest challenges and he said oh raves and satanism, <laughs> raves <laughs> and satanism. yeah it's one or the other and it, it's the so 70s it's, and 80s for me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> childhood famously credulous time did you mm. believe in ghosts when you were a kid i always wanted to see a ghost desperately but um I don't remember what my so in a way what my belief system was. I was just credulous, I suppose, as you say. Isn't it? Oh, well, me and my friend Porky were obsessed with the occult. And we went to there was an occult bookshop in London. I bought a book of magic and spells, and we we tried astral travelling for a while, but we didn't get lift you off. Get I mean, not <laughs> <laughs> Kettering. <laughs> it's not bad, really. Yeah. So, Richard, where are we now? We are standing outside Charity House, the girls' school, the charity school, which was an 18th century building. And it was once indeed a school for girls. And here the most notorious hauntings in Findon's history took place. An 18th century house, very broad, with a very impressive portico. It says Charity School for Girls, 1712. 
Let's hope there's someone in. Oh, here. Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> so, Mark, you're standing on the spot, the most famously haunted house in all of Finden. In the 1820s, 1823, I think it was Christmas Eve, there was an absolute uh, kind of attack of poltergeist activity. Windows rattled, doors slammed, thumps and bumps and screams and shouts, all kinds of things. This went on for months, actually, weeks and weeks. So they had to get people round to try and fix the noises, as they called them. But the, the reputation was such that it was written about in the newspapers. There was an ode by Thomas Dexter uh, in the 1820s. Apparently people used to come even then from all around, stand outside under the lime trees there and wait for the ghost to perform. Say, have you heard the story told now gaining great renown about the famous haunted house that stands in Findon town, where noises loud and dismal both day and night abound, one moment in the upper rooms, the next upon the ground. The windows chatter in their frames, the doors fly open all, the slates are lifted up and down that hang against the wall, the noise is talked of all around, the news spreads far and near. And rumour, with her thousand tongues, makes horrid sights appear. Kate, you live here now. Yes. Are you nightly woken up by poltergeist activity? Uh, I'm not, but I do have three boys that are rather noisy. I have two naughty little dogs. We have grandma living in the annex. We've got the mother-in-law here at the moment. So actually the house is never quiet. So if they are here, <laughs> they blend in. <laughs> they probably moved out. <laughs> <laughs> but you knew the story of the house before you bought it. We knew obviously it was a very, very old house. There would be a lot of history. Um, we didn't know an awful lot about it. Um, we hadn't lived here for very long. Uh, and I remember one evening my husband was bathing the kids and I looked out the window and I was like, Dan, there is about 200 people <laughs> standing outside the front of the house looking up. But yeah, so it was this lovely walk that they do every year and people are still fascinated by the house and people often say, oh, what's it like living in a haunted house? The poltergeist activity was on the top floor, I think, where the girls slept. Can we have a look? Of course. Keep going. <laughs> Next floor up, Kate. Yep, keep going. I'll put the light on. So this would have been where the girls were stashed, where they slept at night? Yeah. And... I would imagine they could have fit quite a few beds up here. It would have just been dormitories and, and not a lot else. Eventually three girls were actually expelled from the school. They were expelled? Three were expelled, yeah. It suggests that they were, they were found you know, throwing things and, and maybe someone caught them out, I guess. I mean, the, the, there's a sort of genre of this, isn't it? Because since the 1760s in London, there was the famous Cock Lane haunting of poltergeist activity. In London, he could source of huge notoriety. It was eventually uh, the daughter of the bloke who lived there, I think, was found to be responsible for these not very supernatural things. But it caused a huge hoo-ha, and you wonder if they'd read about that, heard about that, and thought, we'll put Finding on the map. I think it's a pattern that recurs in that way. The, the Enfield haunting is a very famous one from the 70s, and but there was another one, you know, about 10 years before. And, and it obviously, in terms of teenage boredom, as you say, or, or a, a group of kids, especially uh, adolescent kids in a room, trying to spook each other, and then one of them... I'll tell you a story. I've never told this before. It's not a ghost story, but it's a similar thing. In the early 70s, when Yuri Geller popped up, I claimed I could bend spoons as well. And my family fell for it. And then eventually, I think my brother saw me just bending and that was the end of that. But it was a, it was, it was a little way of being famous for a bit or ex it was something exciting in our lives, you know? So maybe it was something like that. I think boredom and a long, dark winter's night can sometimes make you just want to do anything to liven it up a little bit. I did a, a radio thing years ago with Steve and Reese and Jeremy from the League of Gentlemen. To, uh, I think it was Reese's behest to spend the night in a haunted house. And we went to the most haunted house in England. The producer brought a, a clairvoyant and a medium. We had a seance and I, caught, I just couldn't resist it. So I was cracking my toe knuckles as they as the originals did, <laughs> under, the, under the table. And she was going, can you hear that? <laughs> there, all night long. And then and Reese totally fell for it. And only back at the hotel afterwards, I said, it was me, you idiot. <laughs> I've never laughed so much in my life. And I think that's the best thing about it, sort of, like storytelling and telling ghost stories is a wonderful communal experience, but it's also a tremendously good laugh. <laughs> So 
So where are we heading now, Richard? Well, we're going to head to church, but I think I'm going to, we're going to go there via the Holly Walk, another very haunted spot. Marvellous. We've been to the most haunted spot in Finder, but this is number two, I think. This is where the grey lady walks, also the black lady, and actually also the green lady as well. There's a diverse community of ladies. I've experienced a ghostly figure sweeping past you find. And yeah, not just me. A couple of people I know did in the same place. I could tell you the story if you want. Yes, please. Well, I was out coming out of church late one night and I was just walking up Bell Hill to go home to the corner of School Lane. And I felt this figure just brush past me. And you could, it was like a man who was very angry or anxious or frightened, sort of pushed past me. And I kind of looked and of course there was nobody there. It was just a very, very vivid impression of that. Didn't see anything but I knew that stuff about him. Excuse me. And I mentioned that to David, and he said that he'd experienced the same thing. And then another friend of mine came to stay, and he said he'd just felt someone had pushed past him on that corner. So mm -hmm. make of that what you will. Well, I mean, the thing that fascinates me is multiple accounts. That, you know, if, if you have one person who may be in a slightly histrionic state of mind or who, or whatever, or it's just a trick of the light. But if the same thing happens to people over a number of years in the same location, then I, I find that very interesting. I do too, but I think there's something about clustering with a story like that, is that if one person experiences it, there's a sort of impulse for another to experience it too. And partly that's, I think, to give a, a feeling of veracity, but partly also because I think we, we kind of augment our experience with others of that sort of thing. There is a sort of collective experience yeah, of that. It's like telling a story, isn't it? You realize, uh, you realize when you catch yourself telling a story again that you've already refined it like a joke yeah. and you've made it better and probably exaggerated a little bit and you tidy it up. Yeah. And by the time it's actually told, it's, it's, a, it's a story, it's an anecdote, isn't it? That's what we all do naturally. I remember when I first came to find him, I had the dogs and I was walking on here and I bumped into a parishioner who was walking his dogs as well and he was telling me about the black lady. And he said, and for that reason, no dogs will walk here. And I thought, we've actually got our dogs with us. But <laughs> it was more important that no dogs walk there than yeah. the fact of yes. whether dogs walk there. And of course, Never no mind. birds. Never mind the facts. <laughs> it was just no a, birds sing. And also, no birds sing here, either. Apart from those birds who <laughs> the person I spoke to is someone who's lived his whole life here and his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather before them. And for lots of proper Findonians, they are the custodians of those stories and they're important because they tell the story of this place. All right, here is the very impressive, beautiful and spotlit Findon Church. Yes. But, but Richard, you have been Erased. I've been erased. My name. I know on the parish notice board. Parish just, priest, a black mark. I've literally. been gaffer taped out of history. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, we come, we go. Sick transit, Gloria Hunniford. <laughs> exactly. The lich gate. This is a lovely lich gate. It's a lovely well. lich. Does it open? It does open. <laughs> there we go. This unusually is the third church on the site. There was a wooden Saxon church and then a Norman church, and then they built this very splendid church, 1300, 1350. And have the graves been tidied up? Yes, they have. So, when did that happen? Uh, well, they're they're, all, we must explain, they're all in a sort of neat row. Well, they're all in neat rows now to facilitate mowing. Sometimes people get a bit upset about that because they want the headstone to be where the body lies. But there are two things about it. One is that some of these headstones have been here for 400 years and nobody remembers anything about the people underneath them. And the other thing, there's a sort of tot and chance that bodies move around underground over years. So bits pop up. So rather like one of those slightly irritating academics of an M.R. James story, you would sometimes, if ever we were burying ashes, you would sometimes dig up bones that would come My and great. naturally... Yes. Notify the coroner as the law requires. But nothing stays still, actually. I live next to a churchyard. There was a man dwelt by a churchyard, and um, it's a very old bone yard. And my neighbour, who's been there since the 50s, told me that when they moved in and they were just dig doing the garden, they were constantly finding bones. Mm. And we had our garden done a couple of years ago. And I was on the phone, it was in the summer, I was on the phone in the garden, and I was telling someone this story. And I glanced down and went, 
oh God. And there was a rib and a, a knuckle bone, literally where I was standing. People were burying their dead here long before Christianity arrived because there was always a sort of sacred place to which people would go do that kind of thing, which is, I think, one of the reasons why churches appealed so much to M.R. James, the sacred place where everybody went. Yes, and also that, that sense of something buried longer ago beneath, which is always terribly resonant, isn't it? There's a, I think everyone responds to that, a sort of psychogeography, or that, that there might be something even older than you think is there. That's what the stone tape is about, that there's even beneath the earliest thing, there's something else yeah. which, we, which goes way back. Tradition in finding on Christmas Day is people go up after church to the cemetery and they visit the graves of their That's dead. Very Mexican, isn't well, they it? Did, they did at Easter too. It's a very kind of Day of the Dead sort of thing. And there's a kind of gathering at the graveside and you tell the year's news and that kind of thing. Well, I always say, you know, about Christmas uh, to me, is it, it's a, obviously a joyous time, but it's always melancholy. But the older you get, even more so, and you're, you are inevitably looking back and forward. So it's the perfect time for people to come back. Yeah. And, it's, and as a vicar, nearly every year, Christmas Eve would finish at midnight mass in church, gathered at the crib of a newborn. But very often in the evening, you're at Kettering General in ICU because people die at Christmas. There's yeah. a big spike in deaths. Yeah. So it's often a curious experience of a death and a new birth. Mm. Powerful. Mm. Well, yes, it's powerful stuff, isn't it? I always say that the, uh, I was talking about my, losing my dad last year and um, being there at the moment is the most awesome thing you can conceive of, isn't it? It's yeah. just like, and that, but I remember being very struck about, yeah, I could hear the nurses down the corridor laughing and I could hear a car pulling up outside and you, life goes on, but it, it's, there's something, it's funny when people talk about time slowing down, something extraordinary about that happening in front of your eyes. The only thing to match it really is a birth. Somebody wasn't there and all of a sudden they're there with all that potential, all that extraordinary uniqueness about them. And then at the death, all of a sudden, they're not there anymore. It's powerful. Mm. This is the entrance? The tower door, yeah, yeah. the west door. Um, so come on in. So this is the base of the tower. Belfry up there. Lovely. And then this is the church. Beautiful. Here's an interesting thing, Well, and this is the, come and look at the font. So this is the only survivor of the Norman church. So the font was here for the Norman church. It's a thousand years old, getting on for it. Smashed up, you can see in the Reformation, yes. carvings of the baptism of Christ. And it was thrown out into the field down the road and it was used as a cattle trough for about 300 years and then restored. But it's the one thing that remains from that. How long since you last visited? I was last here on my last Sunday, which was low Sunday oh in goodness. April. So it's the first time I've been back and it. I feel like a ghost in my own building, actually, because mm -hmm. this know. was mine. So that's a bit peculiar. And you feel very connected with the people who did what you did. So lots of the incumbents are buried under the under the flags here. Lots of my predecessors, and you need ancestors, are buried. Mm. Are buried you here. said you one of your ancestors used to be the two. The thicket, two. Yeah. Well, I didn't know about them, but when I first came here, the archivist found that the Christopher and William Coles, who were vicars from 1612 to 1645, he thinks they are direct ancestors of one of them. We've never been able to prove it, but there were no other Coleses before them in this part of the world, and so he thinks they are. Wow. So this is the list of incumbents on sign. Yes, from 1217, when Geoffrey de Tuar was the first rector that we know about. And then if you go down the list, the second column, 1615, 1642, Christopher Coles. William Coles. Yeah. Oh, there they are. And then if you go down another column and a half, there's me. It's official. This is an interesting thing you get when you're an incumbent is that you realise you occupy the stall that somebody else occupied long before you and you hope someone will occupy long after you too. And you sit there and early in the morning you would come in say your prayers 
and the sun would kind of come through the clear story and print on the opposite wall and you'd look at that and you'd think somebody did that in 1300 mm. and that's just powerful whatever you think i think there's a power in buildings i love going to churches my parish church where i went to school as a kid Hyington, which is a saxon church is a very beautiful church and really whenever i come into another one the first thing i see is that one mm mostly from Christmas carol services as a child, I sort of look at the model and see what's different, you know, because it's so evocative still. It's so interesting for me to hear someone like you who has all those reference points in your life and for whom church is a sort of part of the furniture of your life, but without faith, without belief. Did you ever have it? Not really. Well, as a, as obviously, as, as Alan Bennett talks about, a fer, he, had a, he was a fervent Anglican until someone took him to one side and said, there's no such thing. <laughs> I mean, it was a very lukewarm religious upbringing. Also, by an extraordinary twist of fate, and I think just because we had to have a letter signed, uh, and I, I just lost it or something. I, I, op I was opted out of religious studies at primary school as if I was some sort of heretic and I just, I just lost the letter, so I missed all that. You know, I've always been very interested in it. The story of Christ I'm slightly obsessed with. It's the greatest story ever told. It's a great story. Yeah. And I love Jesus films, particularly. I watch them all at Easter, but I have no faith now and I don't think I ever really have. I was a chorister when I was a kid, so I grew up with all this, deeply shaped by it. But I thought it was all complete nonsense until I didn't. And now I'm interested in how it's, it's germane to what we've been talking about. What's belief? What's the thing that is decisive in you thinking something is real and something is not real? That gets very indistinct for me sometimes. I think ghosts are an interesting one that they pop up and jump around in that gap between what we believe and what we don't believe and make us ask ourselves. Growing up, I had an unhealthy obsession with death. I mean, anything morbid and odd. I was very interested in the paraphernalia of death. I just loved all the Victoriana and, um, and all the, all the sort of the idea of professional mourners and, uh, funeral mutes. And I loved it and very, very unhealthy, but I was, I'm terrified of dying. I'm less terrified now. I used to be so frightened of dying and the, the concept of it haunted that haunted me I, I worked with George Baker the actor who I greatly admired on a radio drama a ghost story about 20 years ago and um, he was telling me about a workshop he'd done with a promising young theatre director she took them to a graveyard and wanted them to, to sort of get into an open grave or something and he said don't go looking for death it will find you soon enough and it really resonated with that. And I thought, that's very true. I think that was a turning point in terms of like being less obsessive or less interested because it's absolutely true. Yeah. But weirdly, the more, I think the more you encounter it, which oddly enough is a very Victorian thing because they, they were so au fait with it. It yeah. was, it was less terrifying to them. And I think that's the truth of it. You do become less terrified the more you've seen of it, the more you've experienced. I think sometimes it's terrors can leap up and surprise you at surprise, you know, when you, when you don't expect it. And sometimes people who you think would go composedly into the big sleep sometimes don't. Inevitably, you imagine that somehow or other you'll go, take me out into the sun once more. And when you actually, particularly with old people, they're tired. Yes. And they just, they're, you hear this all the time, oh, I'm ready to go now. And you can't, you can't conceive of that until you're there, I suppose. And one of my favourite as a dying person was, I went to see, it was a parish of mine who was dying, and uh, I read him from the Book of Psalms. I read him Psalms rather beautifully, I thought, from the Book of Common Prayer and the Coverdale translation, which is so beautiful. And he motioned and he said, his oxygen mask, and he drew his oxygen mask to one side. And I said, what? And he said, shut up, you stupid twat. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> wow. God, oh, that's was, amazing. Because he was tired and yeah. he just wanted to die. And yeah. people were coming and like, hold on because Auntie Julia. <laughs> that's good. If, that's the great leveler that is. If you turn around, what do you see? Great lady. Oh, no. <laughs> I'll tell you what you see. You see nothing. But that was where the Dutch doll stood. Tell me about the Dutch doll. Well, this is the reason we're here. The Dutch doll is perhaps Feynman's most 
famous spectral creature. The Dutch doll was over the door at the girls' charity school, and she was a figure, a sort of Puritan girl in Puritan dress, became known as the Dutch doll. And um, she used to come to life and walk the parish one night a year, and if you were unlucky enough to see her, you would surely die. That was one. And then because of that, her feet were sawn off at some point. And then she came indoors, and naughty girls were locked in the cellar with the... Can you imagine how terrifying it was? This kind of four-foot-tall effigy of a Dutch doll. They were locked in. It was terrifying. And then the Dutch doll came into church, and she was on a plinth there. And then in 1980, I think it was, she got nicked. She went walking for the last time, and she's never been seen since. So we keep that spot empty. Until tonight. <laughs> and she well, hobbles back inside. Well, I got a feeling she might not have gone very far, and I hope that one day she might reappear. Love to see her. It's a twisting, narrow stair. So come on in. We're in a small monk's cell, I suppose. It's called a parvis. Uh, a parvis. It's the room over the porch, traditionally where people were taught. Right. And it's uh, essentially jam-packed full of fantastic old leather-bound books. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are they all cursed? They're all cursed, yes. Yes, good, good. individually cursed. <laughs> Well, that's your tour of Finden, Mark, including its most haunted spots. I just wonder if there's anything of its ghostly heritage that has impressed you or challenged you? No. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've, had a lovely, I've had a lovely day. <laughs> no, I mean, it's the same thing I always feel. I, I don't believe in ghosts, but I'm frightened of them. And I'm also, I'm a hopeful sceptic. Yeah. I think there's something in it. I just don't know what it is. I don't think it's the spirits of dead people. I think it's something more to do with physics than than the oh, the supernatural is in fact something to do with physics that we don't yet comprehend. Do dead people come back to visit us? Do you think they do? No. I don't believe in the soul, so I think there is a beginning and an end, and that's it. Is that the hinge, do you think, of which this moves, is whether or not you think there is life beyond this life or not? Yes, I suppose it is. Yeah, and as I said about the ghost story being strangely an optimistic form, because even though it might be promising something not very nice after death, it is at least promising something after death. But you believe in the, as it were, the Holy Ghost, but does that not mean... Just the regular yeah. Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> but do you believe in in ghosts as the spirits of the dead? Do I believe that people come back in spectral form? I mean, I, I don't. Although I have had, I've witnessed and experienced moments where you could offer that explanation. It's not an explanation that I find particularly compelling, but... I'd have to say that I'm agnostic, I think, because I don't think it's something I would entirely ascribe to something happening in our psychology, brain function, I don't know. What have you experienced then? I've only ever had one. I was called out by a very, very anxious couple to go to their son's flat, which was in a converted factory, 19th century. And he was 17 and he lived in this flat and I got there and they were so scared they wouldn't come in. They said, oh, there's an evil spirit or something, ghost. And I thought, okay, this happens a lot, you know? So you go in and you say reassuring words. Um, and I went in and it was a boy's flat, you know? There was pizza boxes, ashtrays, that kind of thing. And I was just going, oh, well, no. And then I opened the kitchen door and I walked into the kitchen and it was bright and spotlessly clean. But everything in the drawers and the shelves have been taken out and arranged in these patterns on the surfaces and on the floor. It looked like an Andy Goldsworthy sculpture, but it was just sinister. There was something about this patterning of these random objects that I got this absolute feeling of dread and my blood ran cold and all those things are supposed to feel when you see it. Goes, nothing supernatural about it, but there was it was a sign of something that was just so malevolent and so awful that I really, really got frightened. And I kind of backed out and I sprinkled some holy water and I left a crucifix and I said a psalm. It was really frightening. I, I always come back to the thing of Carl Sagan's thing of uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And 
that the evidence is very thin. But would you be like a Puritan at Christmas and want to rid us of this no, preposterous no, notion? Or would right. you think this is something which we should cultivate? It, um, it'll be fine. It'll be like Jack the Ripper. We'll never find out. It doesn't matter because we won't. We won't. Enough. <laughs> Nothing says Christmas like Jack the Ripper. <laughs> No, I no, I wouldn't. I, of course, wouldn't want things to just be explained away. It's, it's boring, but it's it's a rich brew. We're both agnostics, aren't we? Because that liminal place in the middle of them is is a fascinating place to be. And also, I've never felt that belief in the resurrection means that you have to unbelieve evolution through natural selection. It's never seemed to me to be a rival claim in a way. I think that you entertain, using the best of your ability, a world that is full of surprises and mysteries, some of them that we can uh, set out and some we can't. Signs and wonders. Yeah. yeah. That's a rather good ending. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, it's been a pleasure to it show really you has. finding and its you. haunted spots. So off you go back to your glamorous life in London and Christmas. Yes. What are you doing for Christmas? I am going to have a quiet Christmas because I'm not actually working this Christmas for the first time. Yeah. So I shall sit in front of a fire and entertain the troops by telling them a ghost story. Do you have any preferences this year? Um, I might. I'm quite tempted, actually. Maybe a Christmas carol in instalments. Well, I remember doing the whole of a Christmas carol to my cousin's children when they were tiny, determined that they would remember it for the rest of their lives, taught myself bloody and hoarse, and they, they don't remember a thing. <laughs> so I'd be careful what you wish for about you. Maybe just a short M.R. James. <laughs> well, Mark, that's your train coming. Thank you again. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. Let's do it again sometime. Merry Christmas, Merry Richard. Merry Christmas, Mark. See you next time. Hunting Ghosts with Gatiss and Coles was presented by Mark Gatiss and Richard Coles. It was produced by Gareth McLean and Simon Barnard. Sound design was by Charlie Brandon King and music by Evelyn Sykes. It was a Baffle Gab and Uncanny Media production for BBC Radio 4. <laughs>